to you about what I call the mesh. It's essentially a fundamental shift in our relationship with stuff, with the things in our lives. And it's starting to look at not always and not for everything, but in certain moments of time, access to certain kinds of goods and service will trump ownership of them. And so it's the pursuit of better things easily shared. And we come from a long tradition of sharing. We've shared transportation, We've shared wine and food and other sorts of fabulous experiences in coffee bars in Amsterdam. Um, we've also shared other sorts of entertainment, sports arenas, public parks, concert halls, libraries, uh, universities. All these things are share platforms, but sharing ultimately starts and ends with what I refer to as the mother of all share platforms. And as I think about the mesh and I think about, well, what's driving it and how come it's happening now, I think there's a number of vectors that I want to give you as background. One is uh, the recession, that the recession has caused us to rethink our relationship with the things in our lives relative to the value. So starting to align the value with the true cost. Secondly, population growth and density into cities more people, smaller spaces, less stuff. Climate change. Uh, we're trying to redu reduce the stress in our personal lives, in our communities, and on the planet. Um, also, there's been this recent distrust of big brands, global big brands, and a bunch of different industries. And that's created a kind of opening. Research is showing here in the States and in Canada and Western Europe that most of us are much more open to local uh, companies or brands that maybe we haven't heard of, whereas before, you know, we went with sort of the big brands that we were sure we trusted. And last is that we're more connected now to more people on the planet than ever before, except for if you're sitting next to someone. <laughs> um, the other thing that's worth considering is that there's, we've made a huge investment over decades and decades and tens of billions of dollars have gone into this investment that now is our inheritance. It's a physical infrastructure that allows us to get from point A to point B and move things that way. It's also web and mobile allow us to be connected and to create all kinds of platforms and systems. And the investment of those technologies and that infrastructure is really our inheritance. It allows us to engage in really new and interesting ways. And so for me, a mesh company, the classic mesh company, brings together these three things, our ability to connect to each other. Most of us are walking around with these mobile devices that are GPS enabled and web enabled, allows us to find each other and to find things in time and space. And third is that physical things are readable on a map, so restaurants, uh, a variety of venues, but also with GPS and other technology like RFID, and it continues to expand beyond that, we can also track things that are moving, like a car, a taxi cab, a transit system, a box that's moving through time and space. And so that sets up for making access to goods and services more convenient and less costly in many cases than owning them. For example, I want to use Zipcar. How many people here have experienced car sharing or bike sharing? Wow, that's great. Okay, thank you. Basically, Zipcar is the largest car sharing in, uh, company in the world. They did not invent car sharing. Car sharing was actually invented in Europe. One of the founders went, went to Switzerland, saw it implemented someplace, said, wow, that looks really cool. I think we could do that in Cambridge. Uh, brought it to Cambridge, and uh, it, they started two women, uh, Robin Chase being the other person who started. Zipcar got some really important things right. First, they, they really understood that a brand is a voice and a product is a souvenir. And so they were very clever about the way that they packaged car sharing. They made it sexy. They made it fresh. They made it aspirational. If you were a member of the club, when you're a member of a club, you're the zipster. Cars they picked didn't look like ex-cop cars that were, you know, hollowed out or something. They they picked these sexy cars, they targeted to universities, they made sure that the demographic for who they were targeting and the car was all matching. It was a very nice experience and the cars were clean and reliable and it all worked. And so from a branding perspective, 
they got a lot right, but they understood fundamentally that they are not a car company. They understand that they're an information company. Because when we buy a car, we go to the dealer once, we have an interaction, and we're chow, usually as quickly as possible. But when you're sharing a car and you have a car share service, you might use an EV to commute, you get a truck because you're doing a home project. When you pick your aunt up at the airport, you get a sedan. And you know, you're going to the mountains to ski, you get different accessories put on the, the car for doing that sort of thing. Meanwhile, these guys are sitting back and collecting all sorts of data about our behavior and how we interact with the service. And so it's, it's not only uh, an option for them, but I believe it's an imperative for Zipcar and other mesh companies to actually, you know, just wow us, to be like a concierge service, because we give them so much information, and we, they are entitled to really see how it is that we're moving. They can, they're in really good shape to anticipate what we're going to want next. And so, so, what percent of the day do you think the average person uses a car, what percentage of the time? Any guesses? That's, those are really very good. Um, I, I was imagining it was like 20% when I first started. The, the number across the US and Western Europe is 8%. And so basically, you know, even if you think it's 10%, 90% um, of the time, something that costs us a lot of money personally, and also we organize our cities around it and all sorts of things, 90% of the time it's sitting around. So for this reason, I think one of the other themes with the mesh is essentially that if we squeeze hard on things that we've thrown away, there's a lot of value in those things. What's set up with Zipcar, Zipcar started in 2000. In the last year, 2010, two car companies started, one uh, that's in the UK called Whipcar and the other one, Relay Rides in the US. They're both peer-to-peer -peer car sharing services. Because the two things that really work for car sharing is one, the, the car has to be available, and two, it's within one or two blocks of where you stand. Well, the car that's one or two blocks from your home or your office is probably your neighbor's car, and it's probably also available. So people have uh, created this business. Zipcar started a, a decade earlier in 2000. It took them six years to get 1,000 cars in service. Whipcar, which started April of last year, it took them six months to get 1,000 cars in the service. So really interesting, people are making anywhere between $200 and $700 a month, letting their neighbors use their car when they're not using it. So it's like vacation rentals for cars. Um, since I'm here, and, and I hope some people in the audience are in the car business, um, <laughs> I'm thinking that, you know, at, coming from the technology side of things, so we, we saw cable-ready TVs and, and, uh, and Wi-Fi-ready notebooks. Um, it would be really great if any minute now you guys could start rolling share-ready cars off because it just creates more flexibility. It allows us as owners to just have other options, and I think we're going there anyway. The opportunity and the challenge with mesh businesses, and those are businesses like Zipcar or Netflix that are full mesh businesses, or other ones where you have a lot of the car companies uh, that are the car manufacturers who are beginning to offer uh, their own car share services as well as a second flanker brand or as really a test, I think, uh, is to make sharing irresistible. We have experiences in our lives of certainly when sharing has been irresistible. It's just how do we make that recurrent and scale it. We know also, because we're connected in social networks, that uh, it's, re it's easy to create delight in one little place. It's contagious because we're all connected to each other. So if I have a terrific experience and I tweet it or I tell five people standing next to me, news travels. The, the opposite, is, as we know, is also true, often more true. So here we have Ludo Truck, which is in LA, doing the things that gourmet food trucks do. And they've gathered quite a following. In general, and maybe it's, again, because I'm a, a tech entrepreneur, I look at things as platforms. Platforms are invitations. So creating, like Craigslist or iTunes and the iPhone developer network, there are all these networks, Facebook as well. These platforms invite all sorts of developers and all sorts of, 
of people to come with their ideas and their opportunity to, to create and target an application for a particular audience. And honestly, it, it's full of surprises because I don't think any of us in this room could have predicted the sorts of applications that have happened at Facebook, around Facebook, for example, uh, two years ago when Mark announced that they were going to go with a platform. So in this way, I think that cities are platforms, and certainly uh, Detroit is a platform. The invitation of bringing makers and artists and entrepreneurs, it really helps stimulate this fiery creativity and helps the city to thrive. It's inviting participation, and cities have historically invited all sorts of participation. Now we're saying that there's other options as well. So for example, city departments can open up transit data. Google has made available transit data API, and so there's about seven or eight cities already in the US that have uh, provided the transit data, and different developers are building applications. So I was having a coffee in Portland, and I'm you know, half of a latte in, and the, the little board in the, in the cafe all of a sudden starts showing me that the next bus is coming in three minutes and the train is coming in 16 minutes. And so it's reliable, real data that's right in my face where I am so you know, I can finish the latte. There's this fabulous opportunity we have across the US now about 21% of vacant commercial and industrial space. That space is not vital. The areas around it lack vitality and vibrancy and engagement. There's, there's this thing, how many people here have heard of pop-up stores or pop-up shops? Oh, great. So I'm a big fan of this, and the, this is a very, a very meshy thing. Um, essentially, th there are all sorts of so, uh, restaurants in Oakland where, near where I live. There's a pop-up general store every three weeks, and they do a fantastic job of making a very social uh, event happening for foodies. Uh, super fun and it happens in a very transitional neighborhood. Subsequent to that, uh, after it's been going for about a, a year or now, they, they, st they actually started to lease and create and extend an, an area that was sort of edgy artsy is now starting to become much cooler and, and engage a lot more people. So this is an example. The Crafty Fox is this woman who's into crafts and she does these pop-up crafts fairs around London. But these sorts of things are happening in many different environments. From my perspective, one of the things that pop-up stores do is create perishability and urgency. It creates two of the favorite words of any business person, sold out. And the opportunity to really focus trust and attention. Is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. So a lot of what we see in the mesh and a lot of what we have in the platform that we built is, uh, allows us to define, refine, and scale. It allows us to test things as an entrepreneur, to go to market, to be in conversation with people, listen, refine something, and go back. It's very cost effective and it's very, it's very, it's very meshy. It's very, you know, the infrastructure enables that. Um, in closing, and as, as we're sort of moving towards the end, I just also want to encourage, and I'm willing to share my failures as well, though not from the stage. Um, <laughs> uh, I would just like to say that, that one of the big things when we look at waste and when we look at ways that we can really be generous and contribute to each other, but also move to, to create a better economic situation and a better environmental situation, is by sharing failures. And one quick example is Vilib in 2007 came forward in, in Paris with a very bold proposition, a very big bike sharing service. They made a lot of mistakes. They had a, a, some number of big successes. But they were very transparent, or they ha sort of had to be in the way that they, uh, it, they exposed what worked and didn't work. And so, you know, BC in Barcelona, and uh, B-Cycle here and Boris Bikes in London, no one has had to repeat the version 1.0 screw-ups and, and learning, expensive learning exercises that happen in Paris. So the opportunity when we're connected is also to share failures and successes. We're at the very beginning of something that what we're seeing and the way that mesh companies are coming forward is inviting, it's engaging, but it's very early. Uh, I have a website that currently, it's a directory, and it started with about 1,200 companies. In the last two and a half months, it's up to about 3,300 companies. And it grows on a very uh, regular daily basis. But it's, it's very much at the beginning. So I just want to welcome all of you onto the ride, and thank you very much. <laughs>